How are you doing? Don't freak out. Yes, you clicked on the episode guide for Into the Woods. No, I'm not planning on changing my format to feature more of me on screen. Nobody wants that. I, for certain, don't want that. It's just that Into the Woods is a different kind of episode, and as such necessitated a different kind of intro. Since I began the channel, there are a certain handful of questions I tend to get over and over again. No, I haven't read the comics. I'd like to make videos about Avatar The Last Airbender, The Good Place, Star Trek The Next Generation, and finish up the Firefly series. Uh, cookie dough. Seeing Red the Body and... Into the Woods. I find this episode infuriating. Now, the reasons why are the content of the following video, but look, friends, I don't like to be negative. So, for those of you that are just here to revisit the show, the ones of you who leave comments like, these are the best Buffy summaries around. Thank you, Gina Nitz83. Happy to summarize things you could have just watched in 45 minutes. Or to those of you that have told me, I don't know why you even bother making videos about Buffy. It sounds like you don't even like the show. When I said I didn't enjoy I Robot You Jane, or she. I don't know why I make these videos either sometimes, Absent Father 420. To those people I ask, don't watch this one. You're not gonna like it. Let me save you some time. Do, 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 wah, 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 wah. Joyce is fine, Buffy and Riley break up, Xander says stuff I didn't like, and Riley leaves. Da -da 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 there. I'll see you in the next one. And everyone's still here. No, I'm not going to say that. We're not touching that with Into the Woods. Let's get this over with. We open on a nice scene featuring the gang dealing with their individual anxieties as Joyce has yet to come out of the operating room. I really love the details here, each of the Scoobies managing their stress in different ways, focusing on the minutia of the moment. What time is it? There's a clock behind you, Will. The doctor comes out and shares the news that, barring complications, Joyce is going to be fine. Oh, just hug, you two. Buffy is so excited she adorably slayer strength hugs the doc. Ah! That evening, Dawn stays over at Casa de Zanya, so Buffy and Riley can have some lovey time. Alone time always translates into get Dawn out of the house so we could have loud, obnoxious sex. That's bullshit. I'm all for the sex positivity the show now has, but come on now. The Riley-Buffy sex throughout, even when they were in the throes of a polterific passion spell, has never looked loud or obnoxious. The furry wall masturbator in that one looked like he was having more fun. Meanwhile, creeping out on the lawn, Old Blood Von Sweater Sniffer catches Riley stealing out into the night to some back alley. Spike returns the next evening and leads Buffy back to the site of Riley's new hobby. This kind of decrepit set decoration must be fun. Why do I feel like that's probably the tub from Giles' bathroom and the hot water heater from his kitchen? People say they're recycling. They're not recycling. Anywho, Buffy and Riley's mutual realization at this moment is pretty affecting. It feels texturally unique at this point in the series. An invasion of adult reality grossness on a level that we haven't had probably since another back alley scene somewhere in season three. There's a lot of top shelf moody iconography here from the heroine chic vampire prostitute, the back alley implied blowjob. I think there's even a potential drug reading given the location of the bite. There's also a cutting masochism element to this. Harder. Riley's inner life has become so intolerable that a little bit of pain on the outside feels better than the story of rejection he has been writing in his head. Sometimes episodes buckle for me under the weight of this kind of material, be it from the why-do-you-make-me-hit-you one-off characters or fascist demon holocaust iconography, but even if it feels a little bit busy, it works fine for me here since the Riley tailspin has been set up pretty much since the first episode. When he gets home, Graham Grant has brought his superior over. Uh, you guys could have turned on a light or read a magazine. What are they all doing just hanging out there in the dark? Wrong answers in the comments only, please. You're a soldier. I quit the government a long way back. We're not government. We're army. Captain Semantics tells Riley he has a day to make his decision. There's a really great scene where the Scoobs give Anya unfair crap and she sticks up for herself. If it wasn't for me, 
Giles would be a terrified old man staring at a quarterly tax statement and wetting himself. I say, that's an exaggeration. Giles gives Buffy the rundown on vampire pay-to-get-bitten schemes like the one she just witnessed. The hazards of the underworld can become addictive to uh, some people. I almost missed Giles' subtle reference here to the Dark Age. Riley goes to Spike to take out his anger with a plastic stake without co-signing either of their perspectives here. A girl needs some monster in her man. Yeah, like that one. This is still a great scene, maybe one of Riley's best in the series, as the two of them commiserate over their feelings for a girl they both believe they can't be with. I think what we bond with is two macho dudes being vulnerable, even if that vulnerability is deeply tainted with some bad ideas. Then Riley finds Buffy, and then... You know what? Let's dig into all this in a minute. Buffy, Riley, ultimatum, words, words, words. Xander and Buffy runs to the helicopter in a scene we're supposed to feel like is really, really ridiculously romantic before Riley flies away. How can I tell it's intended to be really ridiculously romantic? The music. The music is so emotionally specific that it's not possible to headcanon anything other than the episode tacitly endorsing everything Xander said and, by association, the other dude behavior in the episode. This specific bit is a variation on the race for your love or airport run trope. Well, if Hollywood movies have taught us anything, it's that troubled relationships can be completely patched up by a mad dash to the airport. Perhaps a subversion, given it's most common to romantic comedies and typically ends with a couple getting back together. But the very use of a trope common to romantic comedies, along with the music, tells us the episode itself, distinct from any of the characters' opinions in it, has taken a perspective that this is all deeply romantic. I generally hate speculating at creator intent or perspective in these videos, because it usually comes up in the context of considering whether an errant line in an earlier season That's me as a vampire? I'm so evil and skanky. And I think I'm kind of gay. Was intended at the time to foreshadow a major development later in the series, and when considering the show taken as a whole, who cares? Intended or not, the line does now foreshadow, so it's neat. Nonetheless, we've still beaten around that speculative Bush more than once. Most recently, I tried to interpret Shadow's perspective on mental illness by way of Ben murdering six people. In the case of Into the Woods, it's a very relevant question when trying to figure out why. Despite a lot of good here, the episode just feels broken. Thing is, whatever name appears beneath the byline on any particular episode, most interviews I've heard with the writing team say that episodes were often written by committee, with Whedon doing extensive and uncredited final rewrites to scenes or entire episodes. It's also possible that any particular writer didn't realize at the time the idea an episode or scene might be accidentally validating. So because I think it illustrates the point a little more clearly, as well as the the fact that I'm mainly interested in the discussion of these mechanics rather than throwing any particular creator under the bus, I'm going to borrow a page from Supernatural and just refer to Chuck. I write things and then they come to life? We can think of Chuck as both a character on the show and the creator of each episode. Chuck's humanity and fallibility is as much an influence on any particular episode as Buffy's, the Scoobies, or anyone else's. But we're looking through his eyes when we watch the episode, and so have to interpret his perspective through the presentation. Since Chuck picked this music, we can read that he believes this is romantic, if a melancholy kind of thing to have happen. To further illustrate, let's switch out the tune and see how Chuck's perspective changes. What if it was Chuck's belief that Buffy was a about to make a major mistake. Or how about the well Xander was talking, Buffy realized there's a bomb on Riley's helicopter perspective. Xander. Run. Chuck got high at lunchtime and forgot what scene he was writing. We'll dig into why Chuck's romantic perspective of the airport run is so confusing to me in just a minute. 
all of my friends say. Thanks to this rewatch, it's clear that Into the Woods suffers for me from whatever the inverse is of the behind blue eyes effect. The behind blue eyes effect is the scene that elicits the, yeah, but, from someone, whenever I criticize episodes like Go Fish, She, or Where the Wild Things Are. As in, yeah, but I love that bit where Cordelia thinks Xander has turned into a fish and is trying to figure out how to make their relationship work. Or, yeah, but I love David's dancing and that bit where he pretends to be the tour guide at the painting. Or obviously, yeah, but isn't that the episode where Giles sings behind blue eyes? in the coffee shop? I mean, sploosh, am I right? And yes, you're right. My point has always been that those scenes are wonderful, but they can't completely redeem a borked episode on their own. Likewise, I'm not entirely sure I can say that Into the Woods is as bad as I remember, simply because I find the final ten minutes of it absolutely enraging. In fact, as with the behind blue eyes effect for some people with Where the Wild Things Are, I tend to only remember the last ten minutes of this episode. And the thing is, as part three of the dreary trilogy here in the middle of Buffy's fifth season, I actually found Into the Woods the most entertaining of the bunch. It's a little bit brighter, a little more pacey, a little more fun than the last two. There are a couple of good Anya moments, the nice bonding scene between Joyce and Buffy, and sitcom volumes of humor. I also like the title. Out of the woods is a very old phrase, meaning the worst is behind us, or things are looking up. Joyce gets better. Mom's out of the woods. But Buffy and Riley fall apart, going back into them. But in the usual mutant enemy way, the title has a couple of possible interpretations. Into the Woods is a musical, with music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim, and book by James Levine. Greatly oversimplifying, the musical is about what happens with a bunch of fairy tale characters after they've had their happily ever after, and features a scene in which Cinderella confronts her cheating Prince Charming to ask him why he strayed. I was raised to be charming, not sincere. I am how they train me. But then there is everything else in the episode. After a lot of build-up, this one wastes zero time in closing off the Joyce cancer subplot. Your mother's going to be fine. And just after the opening credits have rolled, no less. After one nice scene between Buffy and Joyce, Into the Woods mostly forgets about it for the remainder, making it all feel strangely anticlimactic. We've been building to the operation for a while now. Buffy's weeping privately and quietly over a sink of dirty dishes was one of the more painfully adult, melancholy moments in the series so far. Given the bow with which this subplot is tied off, in hindsight, and at this point in the series, Joyce's illness feels almost purely like a device introduced to exacerbate Riley and Buffy's problems, and once the Joyce bit is done, the rest of the episode is concerned primarily with Buffy, Riley, and Spike. It does have an Anya B story that is as entertaining as it is minor. And Lord, it down, I know I might be headed for teardrops. As we've been building to the Buffy and Riley crash, I've tried to examine the mechanics on both sides that have been deepening the spin. Once Riley started listening to fear, see what I did there, specifically his fear that but she doesn't love me. Any event with more than one potential interpretation was simplified to being validation of that one thing he is most afraid of. And since the initiative and his metaphor mommy died, he has not been cultivating an identity for himself outside of the relationship. Which means all his eggs are in the Buffy basket. In Buffy's case, we've talked about how she's been keeping some things from him and using physical intimacy as a substitute for good verbal communication. Yes, there have been moments where she had the chance to say the L word back to Riley, but there is also evidence that Buffy's love language is touch, as in the way she often interacts with Dawn. And she's already experienced a number of destructive moments in relationships where any emotional vulnerability she showed to the men in her life was used against her. Think of her father, Angel, Parker, or Giles and Helpless. Even the twerpy Scott Buster Keaton Festivus having hope saw her dealing with some things and just went and dumped her. Before we were going out, you, you seemed so full of life, like a force of nature. Now you just seem distracted all the time. Nice. There are some more outward indications of the value Buffy places on her own vulnerability and intimacy at this point in her life. I gave Riley the day off. I don't think he thinks of you as a chore, Buffy. All of that is to say, and my personal interpretation as a Buffy-biased fan of the show aside, there's been a lot to empathize with on both sides of the dysfunction. It's just looked to me like they're both in need of some therapy and a bunch of long conversations about their relationship. That is until this episode. Now that you got me started, I just can't stop. No, no. 
As a willful violation of trust, Riley's back alley shenanigans are a huge deal. The descent in device as a coping mechanism is one thing, but there is no way around the fact that this is cheating, and not simply of the metaphorical variety. Sure, vampirism is a sexual metaphor, but cheating in a relationship is never strictly about sex. These girls. Vampires. Killers. They made me feel something, Buffy. Something I didn't even know I was missing until... It's impossible to dial down Riley's actions here when he keeps blurring the lines in this scene. Buffy then reiterates the metaphorical cheating when she says... Tell me about your whores. And then literalizes it when she highlights Riley going to them trying to get something he wanted but couldn't have from Buffy. It's cheating. Whether his back alley puncture jobs were for the sake of getting metaphorical, emotional, or physical intimacy from someone other than Buffy, and without her knowing about it, it still adds up to metaphorical, emotional, and physical cheating. Cause I love you, baby. And holy hell does Riley lose whatever leg he had to stand on with his conduct in the fight. He opens with an indication that he might be planning on taking some responsibility during the conversation. This isn't your fault. It's mine. But then proceeds to list the ways in which he was justified and this wasn't his fault. I wanted to get you. They needed me. And I don't. Feel you keep me at a distance, Buffy. You didn't even call me when your mom went into the hospital. And makes Buffy completely responsible for whether things are going to work out or not. I'm leaving, Buffy. Unless you give me a reason to stay. He never once even attempts an apology. Even going so far as to pull the you went and got your blood sucked first thing and blaming a victim. I wanted to even the score after you let Dracula bite you. I wanted to know why Dracula and Angel have so much power over you. He nauseatingly rubs her nose into his actions. It was beyond passion. And then climaxes by wanting Buffy to resort to physical violence just to alleviate his own guilty conscience. I'm serious, Buffy. Hit me. Not completely unlike... One good swing. You know you want to. I will not take the blame for this. I'm not asking you to. Yeah, he kind of is. By never apologizing and telling her the reason he was driven to cheat Pyres is because she didn't compulsively need him enough, he is once again making her responsible for his actions, something he's been doing since season four. I can let you go, baby. Speaking of the town sweater sniffer, in his book, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Myth, Metaphor, and Morality, Mark Field summarizes Riley's complaint about the relationship pretty succinctly. Riley loves Buffy more than he thinks she loves him. And since Buffy has become the sole source of meaning in his life... I'm nothing without her. Yeah, that'll have to agree with. Fittingly, given his scene with Spike in this episode, Riley is definitely shoving the idea of love into one single, hyper-romanticized and inexperienced box. Instead of allowing for a more diverse gradient of the ways in which two adults can love and be in love with each other, he's been trying to force the Spike model. Love isn't brains, children. It's blood. Blood screaming inside you to work its will. Why with the crazy? Because I'm so in love with you, I can't think straight. Ugh. But one of the whole points of Lover's Walk was that sometimes the most loving thing two people can do for one another is to selflessly let each other go. I think that you should leave. This is a good opportunity for you. What I want from you, I can never have. So I'm gonna go. That was a painfully learned education for Buffy in season three. But throughout his Sunnydale tenure, Riley has been playing at the romanticized, parasitic, codependent, identity-abandoning representation of love that the entire theme of the show's second season was rejecting. Angel, when I look into the future, all I see is you. It's like the whole world falls away. And all there is is you. Look. Romantic notions aside, his whole world did fall away, and all he has now is Buffy. The solution is not to push Buffy into a similar state of codependence, but to instead create a new world for himself. As Mr. Platt once told Buffy, Lots of people lose themselves in love. It's, it's no shame. They write songs about it. The hitch is, you can't stay lost. And sooner or later, you, you have to get back to yourself. If you can't, well, love becomes your master, and you're just its dog. And because Buffy doesn't reflect back to him the same consuming fixation he has for her, he regularly misses something important. He stayed strong throughout, Buffy. He never even cried. No, I cried. I cried so hard I didn't think I was going to be able to stop. She's still telling him these things. She's still sharing. She's still being vulnerable with him the way she knows how today, 
right now. Buffy gets to choose how she faces her trauma. Being with someone doesn't mean they owe you their literal tears, but she's still sharing her life with him. Whatever Buffy is feeling, a topic I'm deliberately avoiding for a moment, the gulf here is not the one between what Riley feels and what Buffy feels, but the one between the person Riley thought he wanted versus who Buffy is. This is it. This is what Buffy has to give him. This is it. This is me. This is the package. I gotta tell you that I won't let go. But the main reason why the fight ruins an otherwise well set up relationship tailspin is the episodes need to have a ticking clock. It's not that I believe ultimatums are inherently stupid. They're not. Under certain circumstances, they may represent the only ability a person has to affect change in a relationship. Your quit drinking or we can't be together variety of ultimatum. A last ditch effort with clear justification, a clear request, and clear consequences. But this is Buffy and Riley's first conversation about these problems, and none of that clarity is present. I had some compassion for him before this scene, but his ultimatum for a myriad of reasons is deeply stupid. First, because it's utterly unnecessary. We can't work this out. And what? This is goodbye? Buffy, there's no other way for me to go back to the military. It's not like there are recruiting stations in every town in this country or that I'll ever hear from Graham Grant again. Again, this is the one and only second time he's been in an episode. Whatever. I only have this one opportunity to rejoin the military. Second, because the ultimatum ignores, backtracks on, or undermines the themes of season four. Remember how once Buffy, who was never completely sold on the idea of the initiative to begin with, turned on Walsh? All of the major themes Themes relating to institutional compliance and groupthink were channeled through Riley and his arc. I'm an anarchist. Remember all of that intended nuance in the fourth season meant to have Riley call into question his biases and preconceived notions from Angel to Buffy to Oz? Oh, hey, that's enough. Come on, the guy's a student. I know him. What's wrong about Oz? I was being a bigot. Yet the argument used in this episode convincing him to toss all that out the window is None of us give a damn what makes monsters tick. We just stop them. Which means that Riley either didn't learn a thing, or he can't find his way on his own without his metaphor mommy, girlfriend mommy, or otherwise telling him what to do. Or worse, he's just taking the offer to have some emotional leverage over Buffy. And the last stupid thing about the ultimatum is he gives her zero clarity about what he wants. I'm leaving, Buffy. Unless you give me a reason to stay. What? What reason? Forgiveness for something he never apologized for? To cry in front of him once a day? To give up being the Slayer and make him the solar center of her universe? What? What reason to stay does he want? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! If this is about what he said to Xander, why hasn't he asked the question yet, do you even love me? Also, bear in mind the only thing that Buffy has said yet, the only concrete statement she's made about their relationship so far is... Not ready to talk to you yet. <laughs> That's it. She hasn't broken up with him. She hasn't said she'll never forgive him. She has asked for time to process, which he is flat refusing. Ultimately, in an episode that really seems to want to paint Riley in an empathetic light, the poorly thought out ultimatum just makes all of Riley's actions look childish, unself-aware, and, well, poorly thought out. I've been looking for love so true. The whole scene also perpetuates the episode's major recurring motif of dudes telling each other that they know how Buffy feels better than Buffy does. I'm the one that knows what she needs. Oh, yeah? The girl needs some monster in her man. Correlation is not causation, Spike. If I grew up in a burrito factory, people might look at me and think, man, that guy really loves burritos. And that might be true. It also might just mean that a pizza hadn't strutted into my life and made sex eyes at me yet. It's possible that these turds are just the best Sunnydale has to offer. If you touched her, you know I'd kill you for real. Buffy would have to have been dead in hell or suffering the world's worst depression to go after Spike, and that still would have been her choice. Also, as if his statement couldn't be even more tone-deaf nonsense, he just cheated on her! Eventually, it all just degrades into dudes just telling Buffy directly how she feels. I can't... I can't hear this. You need to hear this. I guess the scene is strangely fitting, as lest we forget, Riley and Buffy's relationship was actually founded on him explaining to her what she feels. The story of their relationship up until Hush was mostly one of boredom and confusion. But then Hush happened, and in Doomed, after finding out that Riley was a commando duder, Buffy spent most of the episode trying to get him to leave her the hell alone. Riley, no. I know it may seem. Riley, my answer is no. 
a request which he acknowledged and handled with grace and dignity. Oh, I mean, you're stupid. I don't mean that. No, I think maybe I do. Oh, wait, no, he spent the episode telling her how she felt. I'm sure that there's some good-looking guy who done you wrong in there, too. But mostly, I think you want to stay down in the dark place. Because maybe it's safer down there. The two of them then trauma bonded over the episode's diet apocalypse, always the foundation of any healthy relationship, as well as Riley's strong hands and magic cable, and bam! It's not completely surprising that their relationship should end where it began, with Riley trying to ignore Buffy's boundaries. Oh, for what? All for the sake of literary symmetry. It's just disappointing that Chuck, the master of all these ceremonies, still doesn't understand why what happened in Doomed wasn't romantic. It's just doomed. But look, to this point, all of this can just be understood as two young, flawed 20-somethings doing the best they can to sort through some pretty significant problems in their relationship. They're making mistakes, they're grappling with their egos and suffering from some flawed and selfish perspectives, but who the hell isn't? It's the accumulation of this kind of life experience that, if we're lucky and willing to go through a process of self-examination, eventually leads us to healthier relationships. So, fine. This is all fine. It's all fine. As long as the episode itself doesn't start down the path of co-signing any of the perspectives. So, how'd that work out for you? Oh, son of a bitch! When I was down and down, along came you. There are two necessary pieces of setup before the Xander scene. The first is Buffy burning down the Vampstitute heroin den. Buffy takes the Scoobies hunting, the room temperature squatters have moved on. Buffy, seemingly in search of payback, pulls a hissy and tosses a conveniently left behind alcohol burner across the room that starts a fire, potentially putting non-supernatural sunny delights in danger, including the fire department. The second bit of justification is this bit in the alleyway. Pimp C. McVampire, who previously threw a fit at Riley for attracting the Slayer to his business, presumably because he didn't want to get staked, decides to attack her in the alleyway because Buffy burned down his favorite rat-infested hovel. A fight ensues with some pretty fun choreography that leads to an emotionally baffling moment between Buffy and Riley's vampstitute of choice. The casting and design of this character is incredibly specific. She is waifish and underfed, looking as though she needed her vampire super strength just to be able to get out of the coffin that morning. She has bruises on her face, suggesting she has been assaulted by the pimp, or, for that matter, his customers. She is designed to look like a harmless victim. And then rather than staking her, Buffy lets her go before changing her mind and javelining her from across the alley. It's a confusing moment that frames Buffy as cruel and unhinged. And these two moments in the episode feel character-breaking. Now sure, Riley, suck jobs, woman scorned, yada yada yada. If you're in the camp that believes the alley and the fire scene are reasonably justified by Buffy being upset over Riley's cheating, I'm curious if you're also in the camp that believes that Buffy didn't love Riley. And if you are, how do you reconcile the two? From my perspective, love him or not, I cannot think of any precedent in the series to justify these two scenes of rashness and cruelty as in character for Buffy. The closest thing to a cruel dark Buffy we've ever gotten was when she was bad. When Buffy was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after having been killed by the master. The day after she slept with Angel, he tried to murder her circle of friends and she was hesitant to stake him. Parker used her and she was hung up on him for weeks. Dracula broke into her home to assault her in bed, and she quipped at him over his resistance to staking. But there is, however, some reasonable expectation we can have that she wouldn't behave like this. First, there's another harmless vampire in Sunnydale that Buffy has been letting live for multiple seasons now. Second, she is behaving this way over Riley. Let it sink in. You can have the best time in a car. It's not about getting somewhere. You have to take your time. Forget about everything. Just relax. Let it wash over you. The air. Motion. Just let it roll. Riley. The artificial contrivance in these two scenes exists in order to justify one end. Something's up. You're acting like a crazy person portraying Buffy as hysterical and in need of some Xandervention. So rather than talking to Riley about what's going on, Riley, who already opened up and had a moment of vulnerability with Xander about his relationship, displaying some willingness to hear what he had to say, Xander badgers one of his best friends, who doesn't want it and is asking for some time to be able to emotionally process what she's gone through. Still, depending on the way the scene had gone, we could have almost forgiven him if it weren't for the fact that... Though you might be alive, so, 
How'd that work out for you? Make you feel better? Always best to lead with the patronizing. You don't want to deal, so you hide? Not very Slayer-like. Just leave me alone, Xander. So you're saying she should punch you in the face, then? Also, important note that when the conversation begins, his conduct is even more unjustified, unwanted, and unfair because Xander doesn't even know about the ultimatum yet. He's just behaving like this because he thinks he knows better. What I can't figure out is how you never saw it coming. What? Who told you? Nobody told me anything, Buffy. It was right in front of my Xander face. Uh, yeah, no. But she doesn't love me. Imagine if Xander had capitalized on this moment, taken Riley for coffee and encouraged a conversation, sat down with Buffy privately in early episodes as one of her best friends, and warned her that something might be up with Riley, and asked her how he could support them both. Instead, What I can't figure out is how you never saw it coming. He omits that Riley said anything because it would have made him look bad for never telling her, and insinuates that he saw something she didn't. I thought he was... Dependable. Yeah, I think you mean convenient. Ah, yes. Remember all those convenient Riley moments where Buffy treated him like he was disposable? It was at this point that Xander began to remind me of Daddy Gaslight from Family. You shut down, Buffy. And you've been treating Riley like the rebound guy. Super vague. He gives no clarity as to in what way he believes she shut down or when. If she isn't in love with Riley, then she never shut down because she was never in love with him. Her affection would have remained constant. If he's referring to her conduct since Joyce got sick, then Xander can eat a big old bowl of butts because the accomplishment to celebrate there is navigating the potential loss of her mom, not doing that while attending to her codependent boyfriend's fifis. At most, she owed Riley some clarity about her boundaries and the path she was on at the moment. And you know what? It's okay. Just let it out. I can't. Not now. They need me. If I start now, I won't be able to stop. Clarity was given. Also, if memory serves, wasn't Parker the rebound or Scott Hope? Buffy refused to date Riley until the apocalypse bonded. They've had their problems, but he's never been a rebound. He's the one that comes along once in a lifetime. <laughs> False. Completely the opposite. Riley's entire arc was based on the idea of him being a homogenized drone whose personality and moral compass had been dictated to him by the government. Remember the room full of Riley's in matching outfits? After he rebelled, he lost all focus and purpose in his life other than his girlfriend, and there are plenty of aimless dependents in the world, so no once in a lifetime there. If Buffy had wanted that, she could have just dated season four Xander. You know, you really should get yourself a boring boyfriend. Like Xander. That was the idea. An example of an actual once-in-a-lifetime, which I'm not making an argument for as a sound qualification for dating material, would be something like meeting the only recorded vampire in history with a soul. Riley's are a dime a floppy-haired dozen. If he's not the guy, if what he needs from you just isn't there, let him go. Okay, fine. But you might be a liar and she... Xander's following scene with Anya while well performed by Nicholas and Emma in a bit of a romantic intimacy that Anya deserved a long time ago, has never played right for me. It just can't on the heels of everything he said to Buffy, which leaves me carrying too much animosity into it. These are nice, romantic things to say, but the scene doesn't actually feel to me like it's about Anya or their relationship, but about Buffy and Xander projecting himself into Buffy and Riley's relationship. It's tough to argue that he hasn't been doing that to varying degrees since Riley came along. The writer themselves have been making the parallel joke from the beginning. Xander and Riley shared the military connection. Riley has been on Xander's season 4 journey here in season 5. When he tried to talk to Buffy about Riley in front of the group, everyone thought he was talking about himself. Riley epitomizes the masculinity that Xander has idealized throughout the series. You know what he's like? He's like a cat. You know, a big jungle cat. How come I'm not like that? It's just so cool. I think you're cool. And it's just so telling that Xander doesn't go to Riley to talk about any of this. Riley, who gave him the opening to do so with his vulnerability. Instead, Xander argues Riley's case on his behalf. I, mean, I guess the guy's gotta be undead to make time with you. That's really harsh. Best case scenario, they turn me into Joe Normal. And that's not enough for you? It's not enough for you. You either feel a thing or you don't. I don't. What am I supposed to do? Beg him to stay? Why wouldn't you? Okay. Over identify much? I just can't quit you now because I love you. Yes, I do. 
To be clear, the episode does everyone dirty, not just Buffy. Xander looks like an arrogant jerk, Riley looks like a schmuck. Making fun of season 4 Riley was pretty low-hanging fruit that I happily collected by the basketful. He was dull, a little tedious, and on the nose. But I've actually come to really enjoy the complexity of season 5 Riley until we get here. Any emotionally cathartic payoff, happy sad, or otherwise to all that setup was not this. Imagine if Riley had had to come to grips with his identity this season, had to realize how lost he was and build something new. Or if he and Buffy had had to have the tough conversation about why she never said she loved him, and they both had to walk away. That could have revealed something for both of them and been a source of character growth. In the end, Riley was fine. Just okay. Not particularly interesting, neither worthy of the vitriol I've seen leveled against him by parts of the fanbase, but not particularly worthy of the defense either. Most arguments on his behalf center on him not being the scumbag that some of her other boyfriends were, and I understand the desire to defend Riley through comparison. From the beginning, the show was always framing him in reference to the other men in Buffy's life, rather than by creating a real identity and personality for Riley beyond Mr. Lucas's charm. I just saw um, Parker over there. I just feel like something's missing. He's not making you miserable. But when Buffy wakes up in bed, and we feel relief that he is still there, that wasn't really supposed to be a point for Riley, but a strike against her previous dirtbag relationships. Peace prizes aren't given out for being the latest person not to murder somebody. People who give it also deserve to expect a certain baseline of humanity and kindness from the people they allow close to them. Even after they were official, Riley and Buffy always struck me as a couple people would look at and think with confusion, those two? Really? Huh, he must be a good cook or something. I mean, Riley and Willow had more chemistry than Buffy and Riley ever did. Until the day one of you leaves and rips the still-beating heart from the other who's now a broken, hollow mockery of the human condition. Yep, that's the plan. Did Buffy love him? I don't know. Only she does, and that's also kind of the point. Whatever this payoff should have been, it needed a very important thing that was missing. Buffy. Buffy's perspective, Buffy's point of view. Maybe through someone listening to what happened and telling her, hell yeah, girlfriend, that clown doesn't realize how great he has it. It needed Willow. Remember when Willow and Buffy debated whether or not she was going to do that thing with Angel? I think we're going to. Wow. Or when Buffy came to grips with that Angel was probably right about leaving Sunnydale. Maybe in the long run that he's right. Yeah. Instead, Into the Woods is an ending that doesn't serve a single character and develops nothing except Buffy's isolation. Writing is hard. I think this episode was crafted the way it was in order to give Riley something that felt like a proper romantic send-off, but their relationship didn't earn a proper romantic send-off, and the episode ends up sabotaging all the good things that were done this season for his arc by preventing him from learning anything meaningful from it, as well as abdicating his choices to Buffy. But even at the end of the Xander scene, it all could have worked. These relationship mistakes could be chalked up to just a bunch of young 20-somethings and one ego-driven vampire vampire romantic making very human mistakes as they try and figure themselves out. Cinderella from the episode's namesake gave her Prince Charming the stinky glass slippered boot, and Buffy's run to the helicopter at the end of the episode could have been to tell the tofu white bread tooth cushion, hey, I've been thinking, maybe we could have worked this out, but utterly unnecessary ultimatums that prove you to not be the man I thought you were in season four are lame. Make sure to take your slightly funnier identical hand twin Xander with you as you don't let the door hit you in your collective asses on the way out of Sunnydale. Buffy out. Whatever. Anything. The only thing that really needed to happen was Chuck didn't co-sign the events of the episode. As long as the end of the episode didn't frame any of this as romantic or positive, the episode wouldn't break. And it could all be okay. Xander. Run. No! God! No! God, please, no! 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 The things I put you through. I toyed with your lives. Your emotions for entertainment. So sorry. I mean, horror is one thing, but to be forced to live bad writing. <laughs>